Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer for Bruno Mars, Eric Hernandez. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, everyone out in podcast land? Hey, yep, it's that time. Another exciting episode of The Rich Redmond Show coming to you from two cities, sunny Los Angeles. Jim McCarthy, my co-host, co-producer, Music City, USA, Nashville, Tennessee. Jim, what's happening? I'm going to give myself some applause. You deserve it, man. You're such a hardworking I guy. I mean, doing voiceovers, raising a family, producing 15 podcasts, getting down to the basement to play drums every once in a while. I wish well, I had a basement. <laughs> you deserve a basement, but they don't I really a make basement. a lot of basements in Nashville. They don't. A lot of man caves over the garage. Yes. Yeah. The bonus room. Well, hey, we have a limited amount of time today, and I know that we're going to get so much information and have so many laughs with today's guest. Uh, guest, a uh, world-class drummer. Um, he has been the touring drummer for Grammy Award-winning <laughs> Bruno Mars forever because they are blood my pal eric e panda hernandez what's up buddy look at that there's my applause <laughs> there it is there it is there it is what's up guys yeah man thanks How's for joining going? us man man thanks for having me appreciate it so i know it's been a whirlwind the last decade and you, were, you and i were talking off camera and we couldn't remember if we had crossed paths with each other at the grammys in 2010 or 2012 but i was there with aldine and kelly clark's and I believe, and I saw your band backstage, and you guys all had these amazing matching suits, and we were like, hey, what's up? We were kind of high-fiving each other. Then you guys took the stage, and my everybody in my band, our draw, just, <gasps> our jaws hit the floor because you guys had these insane dance moves, and we're like, oh, my God, this guy is the new James Brown, and you, there's the horn section, and you were just killing it, and I was like, oh, my God, these guys are going to take over the world, and you did. Man, I, I I appreciate that. What a what an intro. And uh, yeah, that was I do remember that. I do remember the high fives in the hallway leading to stage. <laughs> and, and that's actually one of my favorite Grammy performances. The one you're talking about. We did Runaway Baby. Yeah. And and it's kind of the one that set the tone for who we are as a band. Uh, backing Bruno, obviously, but it kind of set the tone for us and what was to come and what yeah. is now known as the Hooligans. Yeah, and, and, and you're the, uh, he's your baby bro. You're the big brother. Yes, that's correct. That's kind of what I am in my family. I got two younger brothers and, you know, they're, they're living in different parts of the country. We really rarely get to see each other. That must be so cool to see your little bro on stage every, every night, man. Travel with him. I mean, it's so rad and it's kind of like, uh, I, I mean, I, I get asked this question a lot. So the same answer, it's, it's the, one of the biggest blessings, I guess, you could, you could even receive as a musician someone working with your family, not only is just seeing a family member succeed, but like for me as an older brother, I, I do have that older, older brother mentality. Yeah. I am a father. So it's like seeing my younger brother just succeed as well as he is. I mean, I still get shaped, you know, the, the feelings when I hear his songs on the radio or, or when I see his success and how people are, are, are taking him in. And it's just, it's amazing, man. And, and I'm super uber proud of him and the whole family is. And it just kind of been it's 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 been a whirlwind definitely yeah. since since we met. I mean, from 2010 to present day, it's like wow, so much stuff has happened so quick. Yeah, and uh, we're just blessed, man. Yeah, man, and and you know, I don't even know if these stats are up to date, but something like 11 Grammy awards and over 130 million records worldwide. Yeah, I mean, it could. I don't. I think that it could be even more now. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so, that's yeah. a lot, right? I mean, that, yeah, that's a yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> you, guys made at least, you guys made at least like 10, 15 bucks off that, right? Yeah, well, you know what the funny thing is, is that you could be any, you could be in an elevator. elevator. I got to get my elocution today, man. I need more coffee. Mm. Um, elevator. An, uh, elevator. Aluminum. Elevator. Jim warms up for his, mm. he puts a cork in his mouth for voiceover. You could be in an elevator anywhere in the world, Croatia, Dubai, and hear your songs. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've that one, you couldn't times. go anywhere without hearing that thing. And there was nope. like there was like pet band arrangements <clears> of it and jazz band or marching band arrangements of it, you know? Kids bop arrangements of it. All the <laughs> yeah. songs, man. All the songs. Kids bop. 
now, now where you know is, you've made it when. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you have kids, Bob. <laughs> I gotta start Forget Radio some City more. Music Hall. Right, yeah. right. Uh, where did where did the nickname Panda come from? So, so truthfully, when when, uh, when we started working with Bruno in 2010, when it was time to promote his first single, um, I, I had just left, or I was still on, but I just take, took a, a leave of absence from the police force. And I was at the peak of my, like, being a cop and, like, I was all into fitness and lifting weights. And I was more into, like, this get buff thing. And wow. I kind of got my intro into the rock and roll uh, world where it's like, hey, after the gig, you eat pizza, drink some beer. And that kind of turned into something every night. And I kind of got a little hefty. And from trying to get muscular, it turned into getting puffy. And our initial uh, band member, who was, he's no longer with us, but he, he was on keys. He once said, we were somewhere in Europe, and he's like, man, you're such a panda, right? And I, I'm guessing because pandas are cute and cuddly looking, you know, and, but they're still mean on the inside. Um, <laughs> and it kind of just stuck, and then they, they would just joke around, call me panda, panda, and finally, I think actually it was Bruno that put the E in front of it, so E panda. And it just kind of one of those things, like, you know what, that's cool, I'll, I'll run with it, because I've been called everything from sticks to... Uh, uh, there's been so many nicknames growing up with different bands I've played with, but E Panda kind of stuck, and here we are. Yeah. I mean, you can't plan nicknames. It's terrible when you try to, they just have to happen in the moment organically. Yeah. Rich, but you're not a panda you. anymore, dude. You're like lean, mean fighting machine. I'm trying, man. I'm trying, you know. What's your, what's your work? They call you there? the vest. The vest. Rich. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, our band, we, I, I still will rock the vest. If, I mean, because it's great because you can take a rock tee or just a plain tee, tuck it in, pull Dress out a wallet, up. throw on the vest. I mean, it's not original, but it just kind of dresses it up and tells the world like, hey, man, we mean business. We're about to go do something special. For sure. I was, I was referred to as uh, Jim Droolman McCarthy this morning in a text. I was going, Droolman? I'm, I'm almost afraid to ask where we got this from. Because you're I'm a drummer. Sure and don't drool. You, you only drool out of maybe one side of your mouth and on a so good day. That's how we tell when the stage is level, right? That's, right. <laughs> that's an old cadet. <laughs> so, so, so what's your workout routine now to stay lean and mean? Uh, you know, so during the uh, once we got done with the last album cycle, I started getting into trying to figure out myself as far as how do I monopolize my game? Uh, you know, I don't want to put all my eggs in the music game. Uh, obviously, we've had some success. Um, but you know, my success goes as far as what I put into it as a touring musician. I mean, you know, you know what we make out there. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I started to group up with some friends and, and who were getting into investing. And so I actually put some money and invested some money that I had saved up into a gym, wow. uh, which was a, which is called F45, but it's F45. It's a, it's a chain of, of physical fitness gyms and, and, and basically a program. And I invested in one particular location and, and that, that's where I was going every day, getting my workout on. And it stands for functional 45. It's, it's a team workout. Um, you've probably heard of it or seen it. Yeah. Um, and it was we a great, had- one of the guests we had on, uh, Libby Vincic. She's a part of that. Was she a part oh, of that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Remember? Yeah, she was a Survivor cast member, and That's I right. think that there's some of those in Nashville. Oh, there yes. are, so the, here's a cool thing about it, and I won't go run on about this, but what the cool thing is that I thought was a no-brainer when it came to putting some money into it is that it's a, it's a concept that was created in Australia. It's a 45-minute functional workout. It's hit cardio, some weights, and it's global. So – Whatever they're doing in Australia today on Monday, it's so let's say it's called, uh, I can't remember now, it's been so long, but there, there's names of the workouts. If you did it in Australia and you're in New York City or Nashville, you're doing the same exact workout as your peers across the globe. Awesome. So everybody on Monday did the same thing. Everybody on Tuesday did. And it's kind of, it just created a network and a community. And it was really hard work. And I saw results. Yeah. Long story short, the pandemic hits, gyms are forced to close. Some let, let gyms work outside, but it didn't work out. So gyms kind of shut down. So present day, not going to my gym that I'm invested in. I'm still invested, losing money. Uh, oh. but, uh, but I currently, I, I invested in this home gym system. It's called the Temple Fit. And it, it basically is like a virtual, it's not a virtual, it's a trainer on a screen with some weights and just trying to watch my diet, man, because the, the pandemic, the quarantine 15 did hit me, you know, you're stuck inside. I'm forced to cook more for my kids. I'm eating everything, trying everything. And 
drinking everything. They want the chicken fingers and the French fries now, daddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they got it. That's killer, man. I've always loved the, it, you know, the, the, the Bear East concept, the high intensity training where you're like, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna use these ropes and then we're going to get on these bands and now you're yeah. going to run your sprint on the, and then pick up those weights, kid, and lunge across the room. And then, you know, there's the red lights and the cool music. And yeah, that, I've dug that. I love that, man. I love that too. I've done, I've done berries. And what I do like, like even what was similar with uh, F45 and this temple thing I do now, there's a leaderboard. So it gives you a chance to like be competitive with other members. So even though I'm at my home in my room doing it myself, yeah. someone taking the same workout, I'm like, I see them putting in work and do. I'm like, nope, I, you're not going to beat me today. So it, it gets me going and burning more calories. I always when I I would do Orange Theory for a while because I thought the berries was berries amazing, but it's so expensive, ridiculously expensive. So Orange Theory was a little cheaper, and I would go and you got the little heart rate monitor, and you could look on the board there, and I'm like, I'm the oldest guy in this gym, <laughs> and I just burned more calories than anyone. I'm like, suck it, you right? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So you're an entrepreneur, man. Are, are you still doing your headphone thing? You had a rate with the comp the Razor headphones. For yeah. No, that was, so that was a one-off deal we did uh, many, many years back. Um, and uh, that was a great deal at the time. And, and it worked out really well. We sold, I want to say, half a million units Amazing. at the time. And yeah, dude, it was great. It was a great run um, that I had with them. And uh, we just did a limited edition. And, it, and that was it for, for then. And then there's been a few things on and off here, here and yeah. there that, I, that I've gotten involved with. Well, that's smart, man. That's really smart. And then just something that's like so consistent and uh, like, you know, the LAPD. And if you're going to be part of a police department, I mean, I mean, that's it's always on TV. Do you ever watch these uh, kind of like cop shows on TV? Are they pretty accurate or no? So, so, I mean, I, I really, I can't tell you, I've, I've tried to watch the rookie a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty funny. There's, there's other shows I've watched it. Uh, it's not so accurate. I mean, some parts they try to get, I mean, and, but you know, it is what it is, you know, it's how it's, it's a perceived culture and policing is, is definitely some type of a culture. Um, you got to really want that job to be good at doing that job and to do it good. Right. You know? Um, so, but that, like that, that part of my life is behind me. Now I could not be a police officer present day. Just, yeah. there's just no, especially for the LAPD. And it was a great department when I was there. I gave them on paper, 15 years of my life, you know, 10 oh, wow. years, 10 years in the streets. Um, but definitely I, I think I made a better decision, you know, trusting my brother and, uh, going with the family business. I love it, man. Now you're originally from Brooklyn and yes, then. Sir. I believe I'm correct. You made your way over to the Hawaiian islands and yes, that's sir. where you cut your teeth playing music. And there's so much music in your family. Your dad's a musician, right? My dad up to my grandfather. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's music kind of ran in our blood, man. And so you were playing in your dad's band five nights a week. We start, that's, that was my start to live entertainment in front yeah. of the actual audience was because before he allowed me on stage as a kid growing up, we had, he always had instruments at the house, in the garage, or somewhere outside under a covered patio. And I would, in my head, play these fake shows. Even with Bruno, we used to play these shows. And we had a show, like, top-down show. And we did the same every day. It was kind of funny when we looking back at it. But we really wanted to be performers. But before we were allowed on stage and to actually really play, we, we were doing shows for the dogs or whoever, or siblings watching. Um, but, yeah, so my dad when I was 10 gave me the okay to, to jump in and start playing drums behind his, his, his group. And that's kind of what, what broke it for me. Yeah. And then later on down the line, Bruno was invited in once he was old enough and they had something that he could do. And, and, and then, and there we went. Yeah. Oh my God. And then what are you like 18, 19 years old? You make your way over to Hollywood. 18. As soon as I turned 18, I was out of there. I was like, I'm leaving Hawaii. Uh, I had the best gig I could find out there. Cause you know, when you live in a small place, small town like Hawaii, and you're on an island, if you're gigging four or five nights a week, you're successful. You've made it as a musician. You had a steady gig. I mean, I had the gig where I just had to pack up my snare and my cymbals. My kits stayed every day. So, you know, you're set, you know, and, and yeah. it was a paycheck every week, uh, playing shows. And, but I always envisioned myself being on a global circuit you know, I, I would read Modern Drummer Magazine down there, and I was like, man, how do I get in this magazine one day? It's not going to be on this island. There's no way no one's going to discover me. 
I got to take my chances. And as soon as I hit 18, I was like, Psh, I'm gone. Yeah, man. And you did it. You made it to the pages. of. I, I, did you make it? You made it to the cover, no? I've made it to the cover nice. uh, of, of a few magazines now. Yeah, man. That's I, great. I've, I've been, uh, knock on wood, I've been blessed with that. Yeah. And I, so, I, so I've achieved some of my goals. Um, and I'm still working, you know, I, it doesn't stop. You know, this, we, our craft doesn't stop, you nope. know, people, people around us are just getting better and better. And, and, you know, as long as we stick to our principle and our heart and, and we know, you know, what, what it is we bring to the table, but yeah, it, it never, it never stops. So there's continuous goals, um, both for me on stage, off stage, my entrepreneurial side and, and of yeah. course music, but yeah, man. That's fantastic. Well, I was going to say, when you make your way over to Hollywood, immediately you get an assigned band, right? Yes. Now, this band, is it Louis Says? That's it. Can we find this music on Spotify? You know, it's not there anymore. I used to be able to, used to, be able to, find, used to, be able to find the music video. I don't know who ripped it down, um, but you, you used to be able to see. I actually filmed the music video. It was a really cool video. Yeah. I don't know where this stuff's gone, to be honest with you. You might be able to find it somewhere if you... The first, the lead single was called Code to the Touch. It was actually really cool, man. And it's Did a bummer that it's these gone. Guys? You know, um, the leads, the leads say I used to, and then the last guy I, used, I kept in contact, we were probably just Facebook friends at this point. It would be Sam Slavic, who was the lead singer. Uh, but now he's like a, a not noted writer for, I think, the LA Times. And he does a bunch of stuff. He's a great writer. He was a great music, is a great musician. I just don't know if he's pursuing it anymore or doing anything with it. But I stayed with him. So when that gig ended, when Louis says disbanded, there was some politics involved. And I'm not sure what happened with RCA Records, but we lost the deal. Um, just when things were looking really green and nice. Uh, but <laughs> it, it all went away. Tour went away. My big break went away. But I stuck with Sam in Hollywood. And we played all the, the Hollywood circuit for a while as him as his band and uh that that lasted for maybe a good six months and then that kind of dissipated and that's how i ended up in law enforcement just searching for work and needing jobs and trying to afford rent at the time and you know coming as a kid from hawaii to hollywood and trying to make it and yeah it got scary and and i started to have doubts about music did you have any um yeah like were you crammed into an apartment with a bunch of roommates trying to make it in the music business you know, I was actually, I was fortunate that I had a sister out here. So I crammed in with her and her roommate. Nice. And, and uh, so I did that for a while um, until I could afford my own place. Um, and, and then that's kind of when, when things got really serious. Like, oh, I'm on my own now. Uh-oh, what do I do for money? Music's not bringing it in. You know, and I kind of like packed the drums up for a while. You know, for a couple of years, the drums were in cases in storage. Yeah. But then you pull them out and it's like, oh. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like, man, what have I been doing and how I missed you guys. Yeah, you can't, you can't shake that bug once you get it. So I'm looking at some of these other interesting, amazing world-class artists you play with, um, backing up CeeLo Green and Monica and Janelle Monet and Sting. and Re Man, you made all your childhood dreams come true. Are th were these all pinch me moments or was it just like too surreal and – it's got to be, you got to be proud of yourself, man. I mean, it's very surreal and it's definitely, they're all pinch me moments just to, to see people that you've seen on stage or whether it's seen them recently or for a long time, idolizing them. Um, someone like Sting, you know, I always talk about Sting because I grew up as a police fan uh, in Hawaii. There's a lot of reggae music, a lot of Hawaiian infused reggae music. So that's kind of like the backbone in Hawaii and the pulse. So it's like, of course, the police you know, listening to them. So having the opportunity to be able to work with him and then share the stage with him on the Grammys and play one of their songs or his songs is like yeah. mind boggling. And yes, definitely a dream come true. And it's something I'll hold dear to my heart every day. All the artists I've been able to work with, even if it's just they come up on stage and sit in with us, it's like, man, how awesome I could say I've played with Ed Sheeran or whoever it may be that have sat in with us. And it's just, it's amazing, man. Coldplay, yeah. you know? Oh my God. Yeah, right away. Boom. Yep. For a while in Nashville, we would call that the Coldplay groove, you know, where it's like, let's do it, start the song with the Coldplay thing and then the verse goes. Yeah, because yeah, we just reference these things as like musicians, you know, we could really get there quickly. Now, was that was your first gig, SN, first TV gig SNL? It was, man. That's amazing. No yeah. problem. You're like in the hallway meeting Lauren Michaels. I mean, honestly, that was what an incredible experience that was and very nerve wracking. And, and if I, when I look back at it, it's like, wow, 
I really kept it simple. I keep it simple anyway, but I really yeah. like was like, you know, and, and I'm a lot more loose now, but that was, yeah, that was the first TV gig for me. Cool. Yeah, man. And when did this, uh, your, your, your E Panda DW signature drum the, the, from PDP rather, which is a kind of a close knit relative to DW. So, you know, we, we, we worked on that, uh, to, through the end of 2018 to put it out for 2019 for the NAM show. Um, and I've always been, I've always had this like pearl piccolo that Bruno would always want me to bring to the studio. Hmm. And it was a three by 13 brass. And that always like, even though I moved on and I was more of like a four by five or five by 14, I liked a little bit more medium depth and sometimes the deep snares. Uh, just depending what I was going for. But for some reason, Bruno was, would always say, hey, let's put that pro back on. And that would end up being like the magic snare for what he was trying to achieve. And, you know, the, it's got the a lot of about, crack. It's got a lot of crack, but what people don't mm. always re remember is they see that small, shallow shell and they think, oh, I'm going to get this high pitched drum when the reality is there's a lot of depth to, to a small shell too. And, and there's a big tuning range. So it kind of been the thing. So with DW, I was like, hey, I want to do a custom piccolo for me actually for the tour. And that's coming up and maybe replace this Pearl. Cause I'm kind of, you know, tired of bringing this, this Pearl into the, into the gig. And, uh, and I want to play with the company that I endorse. So we worked on it and Scott Donnell over at, at uh, DW is like, Hey, why don't we try to put out a, a Panda Piccolo? We'll call it the PDP Piccolo. And I was like, dude, that's brilliant. Are you willing to do that with me? I'd love to do it. Cause you know, I'm all about it. I'm behind it. He's like, yeah, let's try it and let's see what happens. So we, we, we did it. We did a lot of research and development and sending me different prototypes. And we finally found the one that felt right. And uh, we packaged it up and, and it, it turned into a little bit of a success. And, and to be honest with you, it wasn't one of those drums that like it was given to me and like, hey, let me take a picture with it, put it on my Instagram. And this is my signature, but you come to my show and I'm playing a Ludwig Acrylite or a, a, a 6 by 14 brass DW. No, I actually played this on tour, on TV shows um you know throughout the world and it was my workhorse main snare yeah. so i actually could back the you know walk the walk and talk the talk so for for that period of my career for where we were musically it actually it was a perfect fit That's and awesome. and it was we wanted to make something that you know a dw or even pd product something that's accessible to all kinds of buyers not just people that have money you know we wanted something that's affordable and a nice price range that and I think people really dug that and it's been, it's, it's been great. That's awesome. Those are always the drums that sell like hotcakes. The ones that are like, they've got a great sound, but they're, you know, at that price point where it's like, oh, I can do, you end up selling yeah. more, you know? Yeah. yeah. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Yeah, I love that Scott Donnell, man. We, we we've done a lot of stuff together. Uh, just he's got a vision, oh, yeah. you know. He does. He does. He's a good guy. 
totally good guy. So to, what about the recording with like because there's 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 a lot of programming in the music, but there's but there's something tells me there's a marriage of 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 programming and loops and 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 you. There actually it's a combination of a lot of things. So you know what people I mean most people know now Bruno is a drummer himself. Um and I think you could probably attest to this. Sometimes the best recording drummers are not the best drummers. So like he's got this funky, weird, I don't want to say, for lack of a better word, sloppy yeah. feel, but yeah. that comes across on tape that sounds so good. Yeah. And like, so, so he can do a lot of his own pre-production and, or it's programmed, like you said, or like, you know, for example, last time on the last album, here, come play this idea. Here's what I got to do. And he kind of says something that I played. Oh, wait, I like what you did with the hi-hat. Let's keep that. And then looped me. And then what ends up happening? My pattern's there, but you've got all this sound replacement and then stuff on top of what I'm playing. So like, for example, That's What I Like was a pretty successful song that I'm on. And you hear it. And if, if we were to go back and play you the original Pro Tools or then you could hear what I'm playing, it's like, okay, that's cool. It's kind of actually cooler. But I get it, you know, you're making radio songs and pop songs, and sometimes it requires things. You know, Bruno's current project, he's worked with Anderson Pack, who was a phenomenal drummer. Oh, wow. And, and then all these producers that he works with, they all can play, multi, they're all multi instrumentalists So he has his formula. Like, Bruno's formula with the band sometimes ranges from sound checks, and he records every sound check, and we jam. Yeah. Wow. And he might, he might capture something there, and he'll be able to tell his engineer who was on the road with us, Hey, remember that time we rehearsed it and the guy has it all cataloged, you know, Charles Moniz, our engineer, he has it all cataloged. Okay, he can go back to Budapest, you know, this date and, and what, when Bruno marked this beat, pull that out and, and he'll, he'll work ideas to that and sound checks or he'll pull us in the studio. Hey guys, let's just jam out to this. Jam, jam, jam. All right, peace out guys. Leave him for a couple weeks or a month. And then you'll have some different ideas and then you come back and then you may lay your part down or you'll see that it's been programmed. Yeah. But, you know, I've, or, I've kind of taken pride in being the live guy more so now. Um, and I actually take pride in that. I, I yeah. like, re, uh, you know, reproducing music, what people want to hear and giving a little bit of a flair, but not too much, just enough to keep people happy and on their feet and, and you know, try yeah, to do what, I, do what it is I do. Yeah, there's a bunch of YouTube videos of you floating around there. You got some like different like gear rundowns and tours of the kid and you've got some, you know, GoPro set up around the kid with some really cool interesting angles where you can see all your little ghost notes on the snare drum and the splash cymbals right there. And I feel like you know, your kit kind of expanded and grew over the years. It's like, oh my God, there's three more splash symbols in a stack and there's the yeah. SPD, there's the gong bass drum, more toms. Yeah. It's like, you got somebody to set it up. It's kind of a, <laughs> right. kind of a right. fun thing, you know? Right, for sure. No, but you know, all that, all that, believe it or not, yes, could I make it work with less? Of course. Sure. But it's kind of, at this stage in the game, it's necessary but not necessary. Like, I like to reproduce as much of the, the, the genre of, of music we're playing, and, and I like to reproduce the sound so that we can take all that studio element and recreate it live. And I like to do that. So if, if I know that this album that we were doing, 24K Magic Tour, was 90s-esque, then I want what drummers use then. There's splash cymbals, smaller crashes, smaller hi-hats, tighter right. drums, tighter sounds, more rounder notes, not so much dead drums. Yeah. And uh, I try to reproduce that. Like, that's my mindset. Like, how do I re recreate this album and the era that we're, that we're kind of vibing for? And that's yeah. what I set up for. So, like, even though I might hit something one time in the show, it was purposefully, purposely done, you know, yeah. and, and, and with purpose. And, and so that's kind of it. And me having that bigger electronic set, honestly, that's for me just getting old and not being able to focus in on the small SPDS X pad. And I needed bigger <laughs> targets to hit and make sure I didn't miss. Right. Everybody's layers them with like green glow in the dark tape, you know, oh, for sure. <laughs> so you can hit it, hit here. Right. Uh, I, you know what I love? Jim, Jim's probably got a question uh, bubbling there, but I love all the, all the dancing. When I watch dancers that good where everybody in your, it might be just like additional dancers, but there's a lot of guys in your band, the horn players that are all, all doing this incredible synchronized dancing. I'm so jealous. I couldn't remember the steps. You know what I mean? Maybe I could be hip enough to do some of the, but just to remember all the steps. And do you have to catch some of like the hits and stuff? He's like, Panda, hit me here, man. It's bop, bop, like Elvis. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
That's totally. Kind of Elvis, Prince, Michael, you know, that's, that's our influence growing up. And, yeah. uh, and the funny thing is, and James Brown, all the live show stuff. And, and that's kind of why explaining why I went to bigger pads, because sometimes when I was looking for that, okay, that snap is on the second clap. I'm mean, sorry, the second pad of the SPDSX on the top row and then the 808 hit is on the first pad. But I still have to look at Bruno, who's over here, stage left, stage right, like tr trying to follow him and, and hit. So it's like create bigger targets, can't miss, pay attention to my artist, you know, and catch those hits with him, you know, or the band, like you said. Yeah, when you're going for the finger snap and you end up hitting the, uh, the, the glass breaking or the girl oh, going, it's, it's, it's happened. Yeah, yeah. It's happened. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, where that? Actually, <laughs> that's hilarious because check this out. There's, you know, we, you know where you play pranks on the last gig of the tour. One time yeah. I loaded a fart into the, into the <laughs> SPDSX pad. Well, my tech forgot to take it out one show. And, and we kind of did an old medley that we had to use this old preset and I didn't know what was on the pads. And sure enough, during the show, <laughs> <laughs> if you want, if you ever wanted sound effects like that, I've got this great one. Okay. That's a good one. Oh man. I'd, I'd probably lose my gig <laughs> and, my, and my little brother for that one. Oh my God. <laughs> That's when you go to like oh, certain taco trucks. You know, I don't. I you might have some better idea about some other taco trucks Certain in LA, but I always truck. go to Cactus on Moor Park in Studio City, and I haven't really been out much in COVID. You know, I mean, I went to my first restaurant like after a year, but sometimes I get a little practice room over there, and I'll, I I just have to go over there and get a breakfast burrito. It's amazing. No, the Cactus is a good one. Obviously. You've heard us, some of us uh, talk about Taco Zone, but that's in the L.A. area. Oh, that's over on Alvarado at the shopping yeah, center. Yeah. exactly. But uh, kind of, I've been kind of the same. I've been isolated to, to my city and, and just kind of like laying low and hitting all the little local spots or making it at home, you know? Yeah, more, more cooking. What do, you, what do you like to cook? Is it, uh, do you have some like dishes from Hawaii? Actually, no, there are, there are some dishes I can make from Hawaii, but I mean, it's all just kind of like everything from Hawaii is like pile some stuff on top of rice, basically, you know, oh, you could be, you could take a hot dog, put some ch uh, chili on it and over rice and it's called a chili Frank plate. And there you go. There you go. Yeah. But now, are you considered a Howley over there or, um, you know, I went through a phase of being considered a Howley in Hawaii growing up and I grew up there, you know, and, and I was a mixed kid, but, but at, you're not from there, but I'm not from yeah. there. And uh, when I was in the sixth, fifth, sixth grade, and I was living on the, wet, on the west side of the island, which was a little bit more rough and tough um, and very, like, local. And so, yeah, I, I got chased home a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize they would do that. Oh, yeah. man. I, yeah, back in the day, man. It, there oh, was, wow. There were some, there were some, some good times there. But, I, I did a little bit of that in, pa in El Paso, Texas, where you're yeah. running home from some guy who's got a beef oh, I thought with you. you were doing, I thought you were doing the one doing the chasing. <laughs> no. Be, no I've, Jim, I'm 5'7". I tell everybody I'm 5'8". But it's, I'm Rich the bully. <laughs> Rich the bully. Come on. Red man. Oh, my Rich God, the bully man. red man. So are you, um, when you're practicing these days, what's your thing? Do you like to work on like other styles? Do you, you play along with, uh, you know, Spotify or what's your thing when you're practicing? You know, it's funny you say that. Uh, a lot of what I like to do is play along with stuff. And yeah, I'll put on some music, whether it's classics or, or current. And even if it's, I mean, I've even put on like, you know, uh, modern day uh, trap music just to kind of like have all that, all that facility and vibes. But to be quite honest with you, uh, right at the top of the pandemic, I had, you know, I had, had moved. Um, and my new place, I haven't been able to build a space yet. I do have a small setup set up in, in one room, but it's not acoustically. It's not great. I have towels over it and I'm playing it just to muffle down the sound. So I haven't really, I can't tell you, I really, really practiced yeah. a whole lot. Um, shame on me. Well, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. I took, a, I took probably a solid month off at the beginning of the pandemic. We're like, we don't even know if we're going to be able to find toilet paper and we might be cannibalizing each other. Right. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. So, so that's kind of been me. But yeah, actually, I just maybe last two months, I, I, I set that up, you know, small kit, covered up with towels, just so I could at least like have some kind of flow, yeah. you know, um, 
So yeah, but yeah. With, my practice style. That sorry, not to cut you off, but my oh, practice no. style is that I I either go over old music just to remember. I remember go make sure I remember arrangements or try to, um, or like you said, I'll I'll put on some music and play along. Yeah, I've been. I was always such a, you know, methodical kind of academic, you know, practicer where it's like, oh, there's a new book by such and such. I'm going to, you know, work through every page of it or I'm going to work on this style or I'm gonna work on my left foot clave. But in recent years, I mean, the more I interview like these amazing world-class drummers, say like a Chad Cromwell who played with everyone from like Joe Walsh to Dire Straits, self-taught drummer from Memphis, just played along with records and he got all that stacks and Motown, all that stuff in his DNA. Yeah. And it's just it helped him with his time and his concept. And it was, he just sounds like when he plays the drums, he sounds like a, a classic recording, you know? For sure. So For I've been sure. doing, doing some of that, getting into some blues shuffles and 12, eight and some old Texas skiffle music and some Bob Marley reggae, just literally not even worrying about the fills the guys are playing, but literally just holding that pocket and enjoying playing along with a different kind of music for three and a half minutes, you know? Yeah. And get that feel right. Let it feel right. Yeah. And, and absorb it. You know, and the funny thing is this, like there's a lot of guys that like to practice kind of like what you said, or yeah. whether it's reading books or far, following it, or I've never been the guy never in my life that likes to just play drums out on my own. Yeah. Like, like just making noise. I like to play along with something like for, I'd rather practice or rehearse with a band. Yeah. Then just, you'll never catch me like just, I'm going to have to do it a little, I'll do it a little bit, but I get bored of that. I'd much yeah. rather play to a song and have some kind of structure. To me, it just sounds better. And, you know, I'm not the ultimate soloist. I'm, that's just not, I've never been, that's not my DNA. My DNA is I'm a backbone guy, yeah, you know, play the, song. Like, play the song, play the feel, let people feel good, like the artists feel good. And I get satisfaction out of that. Um, I enjoy watching people that can entertain me and make me go my mind go berserk that can yeah. play by themselves but i've just never been that guy and i've always been like you said <clears throat> with him with, with with the comparison used with stacks being in his dna and that just that whole vibe that motown vibe yeah for me um working with my dad uh playing 50s 60s 70s r&b rock was my upbringing and most of my music class in front of live audience playing with the sequencer at the time we didn't have you know pro tools it was sequencers and there was a click track and that was my exposure from 10 to about 14 when i was playing with him playing that and i went from like trying to throw in rock and roll fills in into a 50s doo-wop song to reggae fills and then getting the look of death from the band leader my dad like hey you know what are you doing that's not it's boom, 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 boom. You know, so they wanted authenticity. And that's kind of like what I grew up playing. And that's kind of what I know. And that's yeah. kind of why I apply that now. And that's, that's my DNA. And, and yeah. that's what you'll get when you hire me. That was your schooling, man. That was and, yeah, getting there's so much. You learn so much from the dirty look of you're speeding up, you're slowing down. That's the wrong. You're too loud. Why Stairs bring, too loud. Yeah. Why did you bring the ice bell and the China boy to this uh, lounge gig? You know. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but now you're playing all that music. Literally, your mic, your your music is a is a mix of R and B, soul, you know, funk, new reggae. jack, rock, pop, reggae, doo wop. It's all in there. It's all in there. That, which is amazing. So what's, what, what's next? I mean, obviously you're looking forward to, you know, getting back with your mates and, you know, tearing it up and hopefully the world will be safe again. We go entertain the masses and, but you know, what else are you looking to maybe do in the next five years? I mean, in the next five years, uh, yeah, hopefully, like you said, back with my mates, hopefully we're able to put out some new music, uh, yeah. as Bruno and the hooligans and, and, and to tour that again, I miss the fans. I miss, the contact, I miss just the feeling, the feeling of giving and that return feeling we get from the audiences, just the gratification of why we choose to travel and leave our families, you know, that, you know, inspiring people, giving people a moment of peacefulness in their, in their crazy lives when they come see a show and they hear their favorite songs or they feel like one family within the arena or the stadium, whatever it may be. I miss that. I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully more successful albums and more successful touring. On top of that, on a personal level, obviously getting better as a musician, uh, A, is always first and foremost. 
mastering my craft because I don't think we could ever be masters. I think we can be very good at it and continue to, to want to be better. But three is really figuring out, and I try to teach this to young musicians, and I'm not a young musician anymore, maybe young in the game as far as how long I've been here, but I'm an older kid. And uh, learning how to, like you, you know, you, you do your side work. I know you do your acting gigs. I know you're working on your voice stuff. And we have to monopolize. We have to take our, our, our platform, and we have to be able to, how can we make the most of what we're offered and, and our existence here? You know, and for me, it's like, I'm into businesses. Like my goal one day is to open some kind of small little uh, restaurant somewhere. And it's not going to be like a full blown restaurant, but like I have this idea of this 10 item menu and like, I've got ideas and I want to invest money, real estate. Like I want to learn things and I want to be able to, again, not rely on music, Yeah, you know, because music's such a crazy game. Look at us. We've been out of work and, and been out of playing for over a year. And yeah. you know, we need, we need that backup plan. So I, I try to teach guys like, Hey man, while you're on this, you know, while you're making covers of magazines or while you're getting, you know, endorsement deals, start using that platform to network. And we have to keep networking. We have to get out there. And there's other things. There's other little talents and passions we all have. And music yeah. just brought us to here. And let's use that opportunity to, to hopefully grow. And, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, man. Well, I, I, it's definitely going to happen for you. And I just think you'd be an amazing restaurateur. And I would eat there. Even if you just had a little coffee house with like four bakery items, if it's got like strong Wi-Fi and a great vibe, I'm there. Hell yeah. It's coming, <laughs> man. It's coming. Hey, um, are you open to answering the random question of the day? Sure. <laughs> it, depends. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 it depends. What is a uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, go ahead. If you let don't me, like it, we'll let me hit the right way. sound effect here. Hold on. It's the random question. Random. Question of the day. So I'm going to tell a story real quick before I hit the random question. Okay, uh, we went through a um, movie watching binge not too long ago where we wanted to watch movies that we hadn't seen in a long time. And one came up in particular that uh, I, you know, seen back in the late nineties, early two thousands, fun movie, Nicholas Cage movie. And I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there. I know you know it, Eric. Okay. Uh, well, at least I'm sure you know it is. Um, but it does star a very young Bruno Mars impersonating Elvis. Rich, do you know what movie I'm talking about? Um, is it a Nick, bed on. Is on. it a Nick Cage movie? Like it's like leaving. It no, is a, West, it West, is a West. Nicolas Cage movie. Yeah, and I remember leaving Las Vegas, which was was the tone was very very dark with the Elizabeth Shue and all that stuff. But it was the other yeah, Vegas it's not that music. Movie. It was the other Vegas movie, which I don't remember the title of. I give you Honey a clue. Honeymoon in Vegas. Okay. Oh, okay. Is. Honeymoon in Vegas. Okay. Yeah. Honeymoon in Vegas. Right. We're literally watching it. And I'm going, is that? That can't be. And my wife's <laughs> yeah. going, that's Bruno Mars. I go, no. And we, you know, we IMDb it, and sure enough, there. I'm like, that's Bruno Mars. Wow. Okay. Yep. Okay, got an early start. So okay. here's the random question: What do you do when you hear something fall in the middle of the night while you're in bed? I get up. And grab my gun. <laughs> uh, what do I do? It depends. How much have I had to drink that night? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, obviously, I get up and I check it out, I guess. Is that the right answer? That wasn't the greatest sure. random question, Jim. Yeah. yeah. You want me to do another one? Yeah, one more. All right, hold on. Let's see. Let me get my stuff back. I got a funny right. story that comes with that, though. What's the most embarrassing story from your childhood? Being chased home by the entire fifth grade when I was in elementary school for, for spreading a rumor that I saw a girl and a guy kissing. And oh, I got man. In. That's they should have shown some grace. There you go. Yeah. That's fine. The whole fifth grade chased me home. <laughs> The whole fifth grade. Fifth grade. I barely, I barely made it home. It was like that scene from Pirates in the Caribbean where he's running around the bend on the beach and the entire tribe is chasing him. He's like, oh, yeah. get in the boat. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not one to run from a fight, but when the whole you watch the oh, whole, yeah. the whole stairwell looked like centipede <laughs> coming down, they were all coming for me. Oh God, I was out of there. Heck yeah, man. Oh, my <laughs> God. That's funny. That's really funny. Did you have a quick story about that other story? Well, the story, because the funny thing is one day uh, in, the new, in the new house, you know, a new alarm system had, had installed. And in the middle of the night, you, you hear the alarm go off and it says, uh, family room door open. 
And this is at three, four in the morning. Mm. So you're like, family room door open. So true story, grab my, my pistol where I keep it safe. Uh, proceed downstairs and clear the house. Found the door was closed. And I was like, how, how is this possible? The guy who came and installed the uh, sensors, the magnetic sensors, I guess he didn't double st- or glue it properly. So it's mm. separated in the middle of the night. Long story short is my wife saw me get up out of bed, take my pistol, like, just like I went into like old cop mode and she watched me clear the house. I looked total like SWAT. <laughs> Let's just say I, I had a, a good night that night when I got back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, she liked what she saw. Oh, she liked what she loved what she saw. That's amazing. But, nice. but, but that's my story. But it was actually really, it was really freaking scary, man. Like, it was all like. Someone's breaking in your house. She's hey. She's come back to bed. Come on, baby, make it. <laughs> yes, right. That's awesome, man. The juices are flowing. Jim's crazy. You see where I keep him around? He's the yin to my yang. But man, I just thank you so much for making the time for this conversation. I, w- I hope I hit some questions that others have not asked. For sure. Um, yeah, man. And um, you know, God, I, I I can't wait for this to all open up so we can go out there and do what we do, man. Yes, sir. Do you have a way to be found uh, on the on the World Wide Web? Do you like people to find you? Yeah, sure. It's uh, www.richredman.com. <laughs> <laughs> forward slash listen. Forward slash, uh, no, uh, I'm on Instagram. That's kind of like the main thing that I'm on. It's epandagram, E-P-A-N-D-A-G-R-A-M. And that's the main place I kind of just keep, keep social. I mean, I do have Facebook. I think it's epanda as well. Uh, but Instagram's kind of been the thing I stuck with. And uh, that's it, man. Eric nice. Hernandez, thanks for joining us, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh, next time, choose a better random question. I'll try. <laughs> they're random. I don't yeah, choose they're, them. They're truly randomly generated. Oh, are they really? Completely yeah. random. Yep. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, yeah, true to form. Thanks for joining us, man. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you guys. Yeah. And to See all you. the listeners out there, thanks for listening. We've got an email address for you, the Show at gmail.com. As always, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, review, tell a friend. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Eric. All right, thank you, guys. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.